day, mediation, there was no such thing. So probably not. I've been practicing over 25 years, and it started shortly after, I guess. Um, and it started out as, why do we need mediation, right? You know, why can't we just pick up the phone and get cases settled? When I'd walk into the mediation room, the media would go, oh, my gosh, what is he doing here? Because it interfered as a defense attorney it interfered with our revenue. So I was not on board with mediation. It's, I don't want this case to settle because that hurts my bottom line. And then I realized that's probably a bad attitude. And, and it evolved into from me taking the approach, I'm not telling anybody anything about my case because then we'll go to try it, to that's probably not in the best interest of my clients and the insurance companies. And okay, let's use this process for what it was intended. And then all of a sudden, the cases started to settle, and I went rogue. When, we, when mediation first started becoming popular, um, as I recall it, I didn't like it. I thought, you know, kind of not, not for different reasons, but I thought, well, I went to law school, and I spent all this money and time, you know, getting my law degree and learn how to try cases. And that's what real lawyers do. They don't settle. They don't crumble. They go to the courthouse, and they throw the cards out, and they hope that the jury, you know, believes and likes their side of the case better. And, and I saw that, too. I mean, it was as if... It was as if everybody was, was on a different mission than what mediation was really supposed to be. And I can remember going into mediations, you know, as that defense advocate or whatever, and like trying my case as if I were, if, as if I were in a courtroom, which, you know, is utterly ridiculous when we think about the process of what it should be. Uh, there was a learning curve, I think, sure. especially for seasoned trial attorneys who had been practicing, who only could think one way. Uh, and it really, um, there was a, uh, certainly a, a learning curve for, for everybody. I would agree with that. When mediation came for me, though, I was doing plaintiff's work. And so I had a whole different appreciation for it that I had 100 cases and I could go to Gwinnett County ADR for free, which was big because if you have a small case, that expense makes a difference. And then I could get some of these cases closed pretty efficiently. So to see that practice from that side before I went to the other side really worked for me to be able to, to start that process and, and get people like Craig, Craig Avery to the table to see if he'd pay me some money. Well, and I think, I, think that, I think you hit upon the actual problem was there was, there was everybody was suspicious and there was no trust at all. Um, and I think that's just, again, back to the learning curve issue. It really took a while for people to figure out, hey, this actually works. Yeah, be open to the process yeah. and, and give information where you want to hold it tight when you're you know, going to try your case. But. Right, and I think there too was a shift from the perspective of our clients too, where some of the carriers would want to try all the cases and it dawned on them, really that's not the best use of our dollars. Risk yeah, let's go into these, these things open-minded and compromising and resolve cases. And it's evolved quite a bit. I, I don't know the statistics, but the trials continue to go down and the mediations continue to go up. As they should, they right. really should. And part of that might be just the nature of court-ordered mediation, but still the judiciary knows the process works, so why wouldn't they do that? So it's just a natural evolution, I think. I mean, I foresee that 100% of the cases that are in litigation, at least personal injury cases, you know, that sort of stuff, are going to end up going through this process. When, and we're close to that now. Sure. Yeah, and I, and I won't name names, but there was recently a, a battle between a couple of lawyers where the judge says, this makes our system look bad. You're going to mediation. So not naming names. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody, I think the... Power, the judges recognize the benefits before maybe the lawyers did. Well, it amazes me just to see how our practices have, have evolved that it used to be, well, maybe we'll think about mediation to now. It is just a natural course of this is what you're going to do with the case. It's I mean, it's, issue. yes, it's are you going to do it pre mediation or pre litigation, shortly after, or, you know, right before trial? But it's just now it's part of the process. Exactly. I think it's an interesting observation, too, just. Uh, because we've all had a lot of experience and all been practicing 25, 30, over 30 years. Um, the younger attorneys that are coming up now, that's just been part of their curriculum in law school, and they are already tuned into it. 
And one of the things I like about the mediation process, when I get, and I'm talking about the 40 and under crowd that come to mediate with me, they already understand the process. It's not like teaching the old dog new tricks kind of thing. They, everybody has modified how they, how they handle mediations, but I think that's one of the exciting things is to see those good young attorneys who understand the process, sure. like you, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> understand that most cases probably need to settle and you're not gonna try every case. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it makes a difference. Plus, for them. if you're a younger lawyer, a mediating, being in a mediation in those circumstances is a whole lot more fun than going to trial. Well, and I think it's replaced trial for the young lawyers mm -hmm. yeah. for the very reason you mentioned, the cases just aren't tried as much. So that's kind of their day in court. And well, inefficiency. I mean, the younger lawyers are very, you know, when we started, it wasn't laptops and cell phones and all that sort of stuff and paperless. But now it's more streamlined, more efficient. It's not, I'm going to work till 10 o'clock on every night and be weekends. It's the, the values have changed. Things have changed. And, you know, if this is ultimately going to get resolved through a settlement, how do we get to that point sooner rather than later? One of the problems of being a trial attorney is that you can't really control your schedule. And it was a challenge. I, was, I found myself, surprisingly, mediating five to seven cases a month. And sometimes that was hard to plug in to the calendar, and especially with the volatility in the calendar. And there came a point where, I mean, I knew this was what I wanted to do. Uh, and part of it's a leap of faith. Um, and again, I'm not speaking about geographical locations, but there really were no full-time mediators in the Savannah, Georgia area. There were a lot of people like me who married their mediation practices with their, um, their caseload, whether they were trial attorneys or not. And I think part of the, um, the most difficult, one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my legal career, because I had a very successful litigation practice, was to say, I am a full-time mediator, and to put that out to the public, not knowing how that was going to be um, perceived uh, because of my trial experience and what I've always done or was known as in, in the legal community. And um, I can't explain to you the answer as to why it worked, but it worked. And you know, joining Miles has just broadened that horizon to allow me to have, uh, you know, be, to be better known all over the state as opposed to just in the Savannah, Georgia area. So part of it, the answer is actually making the internal decision. I also had a law firm that said, if it doesn't work, it's okay, you can stay. Um, but having the support of them, and I do give them a lot of credit for giving me the, the um, nerve to make that transition and then supporting me through that transition, um, and it just grew. And, and, I, and I'm trying to learn as well, but like with you, Sally, you've got a certain point of reference, but then you've got the point of reference for like malpractice case mediation. Do you have the same mindset from a car wreck to a, a slip and fall premises case to a malpractice? Do you do you change with the case or <laughs> Great how question. does that work? You know, I don't really think I do. Um, I think I use the, well, every person of course is different. And so you, I, different skill sets to build rapport with the plaintiff, I think I would say, and those are different probably in those different kinds of cases. Um, but I know, I think the, I think the skill set remains fairly similar regardless of what kind of case you're mediating. And because I feel that way, I'm not intimidated to handle cases that I didn't handle as a lawyer because I don't know all the specifics or how I would try it at trial. Right. Um, now, the ones that I did handle as a lawyer, it's certainly easier for me to get up during the mediation, which I do quite frequently, and give the other side's closing argument and say, now, how are you going to respond to that? Right. Can't do that you know, if I'm not familiar with, the, with all the ins and outs. Um, but no, I think it, the skill set's transferable, translatable. Yeah, uh, you know, the starting the mediation practice, the, the, the one thing that's been lucky for you guys that I didn't have was I had to, to, to quit my job, you know, and jump. And I was happy to do that, but that's been difficult in, in growing the, the mediation practice because I didn't 
have that safety net or the partners or the firms, you know, that, that helps you grow that practice. And at one point in time, I had to go back to, you know, part-time work to, to make this work. I'm glad that I did. Um, you know, as far as the, the transferable skills or whatever, it's like you said, you know, you have the same, try to have the same rapport, no matter the com complexity of the case. I mean, eventually you're talking about damages and money and, you know, whether it's 10000 or a million dollars, you know, the case has a certain value. Um, but as far as the facts are concerned, you know, that's one of those, you just have to go on the case by case basis. All of us here have tried enough cases and heard enough Every day is a law school exam, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. What about you? Now you answer yeah. that question. Uh, um, I, I just think there's, in the world we're in, there's so much experience-based that, like the four of us just have this huge experience with having been to trial and seeing outcomes. We have the experience to put some meat behind what we're saying. Yeah. We know because we've been there in the yeah. trenches. And I think that's that's something that you could say comes with age, but it also it really comes from experience. I personally rarely see someone who is not giving an effort in, when they're coming to mediation, whether it's court ordered or not. I mean, that's just my experience. Um, yes. Some are more prepared than others, but you know, that can be a multitude of reasons. That can be um, either the facts haven't been completely developed. It could be their experience is a little bit lacking in, in how to present the case on behalf of their client. That's just, but my experience is generally speaking, yeah. I rarely have anybody come to a mediation where they're not trying um, I mean, we've all had experiences where we wonder how seriously they're taking the process, but I think it's rare. And I, I think a skillful mediator can fix that problem. That's the point. Sometimes you get two lawyers that just don't get along, mm -hmm. and they'll say, well, I don't care what Craig Avery says. It's, I'm not buying it mm -hmm. uh, as a lawyer. And, and then just get in these battles, and the skillful mediator can say, okay, what's the downside of settling this case? Mm -hmm. Uh, for a, a fair to everybody amount. Well, there really is no downside. Well, then let's just talk about it. And then you have to, there are some barriers. I used to be one of those lawyers. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be here. I don't want to offer money. Uh, I want to try this case. That's what I became, a, like you, Sally. I became a lawyer to be a trial lawyer, not a settling lawyer. But and, do, do you see that in the mediation process? Do you see lawyers that are so contentious that, that I, I rarely, part of it's a, it's setting a mood and a tone, but I rarely see attorneys who can't be in the same room with each other. Uh, it, not much, but they, again, I think the skillful media, because some of that flows over into the client. So I'll spend some time mm -hmm. being the voice of reason and the client says, well, okay, mm -hmm. there is a benefit to me and you know, I can see where my lawyer doesn't like this guy, but you know, at the end of the day, if I get my case settled, right. I don't care so much. So a lot of those, you can get the mm -hmm. testosterone out of the room sometimes mm -hmm. and, okay, yeah, this can work. And I, most, try, most I try to set the tone at the beginning um, in, of the mediation and, and make it very straightforward that my lawyers aren't there to make a decision. I mean, I'm just frank about it. I'm like, the plaintiff is going to be the one that's at the end of the day has to live with the settlement and make that decision. Now, the lawyers are going to advise, they're going to counsel, and I'll talk directly to the plaintiff. You know, this is your decision. That's not, they can't promise you, they can't guarantee, you know, and that goes in both rooms, the, both the plaintiff room and the defense room of, you know, just like you said, an effective mediator being able to handle that situation. And, and there's always something to learn at mediation, even if you don't settle it. If they say, well, we're going to go try this case. Well, then let's, let's figure out how we're going to try this case. What work do we need to do? What holes do you have? Where's the defense? What's the prosecution going to do? How are we going to get this case to trial if that's, in fact, what's going to have to happen in this case? There's always a benefit, I think, that you can make them realize. Right, and I always tell them that usually at some point, either during my opening remarks or during the day at some point, you know, nothing bad can happen today, right? Mm -hmm. We can either get the case settled or you'll gain information. Mm -hmm. And the information is power. And don't you want to know, mm -hmm. you know, what exactly, like you said, what you need to do to make this case mm -hmm. get settled? And to the Mr. Plaintiff, 
you're going to be, you haven't given up anything. We don't get it settled. You're in the same place that you were when we started this morning. So it, everybody wins no you know, matter what the outcome. The most interesting thing to me, and I know all, we all see it all the time, is that the defense attorney could go into the plaintiff's room and say the exact same things that we are saying, but because we are neutral, they listen, whereas if the defense attorney said it, they wouldn't. And it's just amazing to me uh, how that that is a, a constant. Um, and just, that's both words. Yeah, I mean, and I just use that as an yeah. example, but yeah. yeah. And it's, it's sometimes the tone, again, as my wife Sure. Yeah. Yeah. How you say it. How you say it. Yeah. yeah, you have to find a common ground, an interest, a, a, some yeah. connection with the plaintiff to, to make that work. I think that's one of the most interesting challenges that we have. Sally and I often uh, commiserate about how did you garner that trust with the plaintiff in the first 15, 30 minutes of the mediation. And it's that's one of the things that makes it so interesting every day is because it's different every day. That's what I love about it. Yeah, I do too. And it's, um, it's challenging and you really cannot do the same thing every day. Okay. You have to bend and mold to, to make that happen. Well. Can tell you that my last trial, I always say that the, the my goal in life as a, a trial attorney was to never end up on the front page of the Daily Report. Which Here, of course present. Is a, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. been there, done that, especially as yeah. a defense lawyer, which means you had a big verdict against you. So I would say that my last trial uh, that I had as an insurance defense lawyer, I made it straight on the front of the, of the Daily Report. And, you know, there's a couple things with this story. It was a seven-figure case. You know, sometimes you hurt people, right? I mean, sometimes there's a value to that case. But what I always say about that is, is if myself, it was mediated, and it was mediated here at Miles, and it came to an impasse, um, and there was a, a predominant um, trial attorney that they hired to come in and try the case for them, and we turned a five-day case into a two-day case, but, you know, he and I were talking, preparing for trial, and we both agreed on the value. We, we knew the value of the case, but we could not get our respective clients to agree on it. Um, and so, you know, it was a seven-figure verdict, but I always said a couple things about it. Number one, he asked for 10 times that, right? Um, it was within my value of the case, and of course, it was within my policy limits. So I said, you know, those are all wins. You know, you're, 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 you don't see that part in, in the daily report, but you know, it was a significant injury significant damages, um, and, you know, you survived. I had a, I had a case uh, where the verdict, I take this as a victory because the, the verdict was over $3 million, and after the verdict was read, my client goes, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I said, there aren't too many lawyers that have a client say, thank you, Jesus, after you've just been tattooed for $3 million. <laughs> been there, done that. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> I think it's it's something to be said as a trial attorney, um, and this is, again is points of reference that you can use in your mediation practice is losing that big case and then getting back in the saddle and keeping focused and moving on to the next one and not let it um, jaundice the whole process because again, as attorneys, we are advocating for our clients obviously, um, there are life lessons that I think translate nicely into perspective in the mediation world. And, um, you know, I, I don't, at the time, I did not feel that that was a great day for me. But in hindsight, there are always reference points to things that I go back and went, well, I lived through that. And I did, I know I did the best I could for my client. Um, and, you know, again, it's just back to points of reference. I had one with, with Jack and Sutton Slover, and it was the biggest check I ever wrote for the insurance company, and we were in front of Judge Wong probably four times, and Judge Wong's like, I'm mediating this case, I'm mediating, you guys are gonna settle this case, you're gonna settle this case, you're gonna settle this case, you know, it was a, a commercial carrier, you know, horrific accident sort of thing, and we eventually we did, you know, because, you know, a lot of cases you don't wanna try, you, they need to get resolved. I had mentioned this, uh, mentioned this before, but it is true, our backgrounds being sort of similar, 
even though we didn't know it, we were mediating cases before we even knew what mediation was. And I think that is so relative today because we were dealing with plaintiff's attorneys, we were dealing with insurance adjusters, we were kind of that yes. middle man or woman, if you will, um, really trying to figure out objectively how to get a case settled before there was even the term mediation used. you have a successful trial practice and you are busy, it, the mediation seems to me to be the, the, the only way to go. You know you're going to try 5 to 10 percent, but that other 90 percent of the cases have to get resolved some way. And to put the focus in, in like, like we said earlier, it's a no-lose situation. I mean, you're either going to learn more about trying the case or you're, or you're going to get the case resolved, and that goes for both sides. So I, th I think it's just a matter of timing yes. when the mediation should be set. Yeah. From the plaintiff's lawyer's perspective, it's better to get the case resolved through mediation because uh, set aside the risk, but the time, you know, the, the time cost. value and the cost. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, the, you know, clock. They, uh, if you're a plaintiff's lawyer, you've got to try a certain number of cases because you've got to let the defense know that you'll go to the courthouse. So kind of a, you know, balance. Yeah, it is. But there's always enough cases out there, just like you said, to try. Yes. You know, and the, and the fact of the matter is the highest percentage settle, and they should. You know, you can't be out there trying a case every week. And if you're not settling cases, which the most efficient way to do it is through this process, then you've got a problem. Yeah, I'm, you know, I really, I'm kind of like you, Dan. I've not met any lawyers that are not interested in the mediation process because mm -hmm. the benefit so far outweighs the risk. I only had one, but he was from a different state, so it might be that mediation is handled differently, and I really came away with the feeling that he, he came with no money, and um, he I think he was just using it as a discovery tool, but one-off thing, yeah. um, just trying to get information. Yeah, there is, and I've had lawyers tell me I don't really believe in the mediation process. The judges made me be here, or whatever the case may be, or you know, costs or however that might, might be. But, you know, again, I think usually they leave at the end of the day, especially if there's a resolution, you know, happy. But with the realization that, you know, there's always a benefit to mediation, even if it's not resolved. I, I see this a lot, especially in uh, commercial cases where you have slip and fall, a landlord tenant, you know, that sort of stuff where you have a property management company uh, the actual landowner, the tenant, you know, and you have a franchisee, franchisor, and you get into those sorts of situations. I had one where each room, of course, is pointing the finger at the other. We're only paying 5%. We're paying no, no money. You know, we have no liability at all in trying to work through that situation. And just through just basic tenacity and keep going into the rooms and, and you know, seeing if we can work this out, talking to to the claims reps, the adjusters on the liability issues to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Uh, you know, we eventually work through that, but that, I see that a lot in, in those sorts of situations um, to be some of my toughest cases to, to work through and to get resolved. Um, I recently mediated a medical malpractice case, and, um, you know, it was a significant case. It was a death case, and it unfortunately did not resolve the day of mediation. Um, but I don't like when that happens. Um, so I generally try to follow up and was able to over the course of about 30 days after the mediation, the defense lawyer gave me permission to speak directly to the adjuster. He said, if you want me on the phone, fine, but if not, here's his number, go to it, you tell him what you think. Um, and of course had the plaintiff's lawyer and it took about a month, but we finally were able to, to get a number that everyone could live with. And sometimes it does take, you know, marinating on it a little bit um, after the day of mediation. Um, and sometimes I've found there's a couple lawyers that I mediate for from time to time who very rarely settle the day of mediation, and it's because they don't want their clients to feel pressured, and it's usually the plaintiff's lawyer, of course, mm -hmm. um, that they're making, that they're being forced into something or making a snap decision. So those I will also follow up on to make sure, hey, I remember the last offer, and um, to try to get those shut down as well. Yeah, and to, to make sure that the, sometimes the, to understand that the additional authority to be gotten from the insurance company just can't happen on, on a dime. You know, there's a process that has to go 
three to, to get that additional. I look at it as our responsibility. Uh, when you, and you know when this happens, when a case does not settle, you know through our, our experiences when to jump back in. You know, sometimes it does need to marinate or cure, as I like to say, but sometimes I always, always tell counsel, use me as the catalyst. Use me as the, the one to uh, foster further discussion. And sometimes I'll just make the call. I think sometimes we have to be proactive because everybody gets busy once everybody's not focused on the case. Um, but I've had really good success in following up. And I think that's actually, I've had a lot of people comment back to me, and I'm sure to you too, thank you for jump-starting those discussions again because we knew it was a settleable case. It just needed some prompting. <laughs> Yeah, I send I send out a follow up email about every thirty days just to even if they don't use me to start the communication between them because they you know everybody gets so busy. Sometimes, candidly, I, I again learn from mistakes. I had a multi party case where all the def all the defendants said the problem is the plaintiff has unrealistic expectations, and at the end of the day the plaintiff's expectations turned out to be reasonable and the defense right. which I never saw coming I go well, I thought the issue was him not y'all and it was y'all not him uh -huh. so I had to follow up mm -hmm. on that one and it ultimately mm -hmm. settled because collectively they said well maybe we are the problem mm -hmm. we did accomplish the goal and the case resolved months down the road mm -hmm. so we do learn or at least I learn Uh, I think everybody has to be flexible in the mediation process to be effective, um, but everybody has their own style. I do modify that style, but if I had to kind of point to um, one particular type of style, I am a more evaluative mediator than maybe some people like. Now, I can disguise that. I don't have to come out and say, I'm an evaluative mediator, ask me what I think. Um, but if they ask me, I'll be glad to tell them. Some mediators won't, and I, I think that that's actually sometimes we're invited to do that on purpose. I'm never going to impose my, you know, real thoughts into the process unless I think it's in, it's necessary. But the reality is, a lot of times, plaintiffs' counsel wants to know. Sometimes they want a neutral to tell their client that. Um, sometimes a dose of reality needs to go into the defense room and say, you have undervalued this case. That's a hard discussion to have. I don't know what y'all think, but it's really hard sometimes to give them some things to think about and to let them know that they may not be looking at this with the full picture. And again, that's not everybody's cup of tea. And those people that don't like it probably don't use me. But I, th I, th I have found it to be very effective. I think it's something that you grow into and changes. I think it's like what you say, that it, each mediation is a little bit different. But I think all of us at this, this table are, you know, if somebody's going to ask us our opinion, we're probably going to give it. You know, if, you really, if you're going to ask me, then I'm going to be pretty direct and say, well, here's what my thought process is. You were talking about having those discussions in the defense room. That's all my mediations were this week, discussions in the right. defense room. Why would they ask you? Why would they ask you that? Why would somebody ask you? Because they want my opinion. If you don't want my opinion, don't ask. Exactly. You know, it's a sort of thing. So I would say I'm more evaluative. I would probably go on more of that that radar. You know, that on that spectrum. You know what I love is there's a problem that gets solved. I love solving problems. It's a challenge. It's fun. Uh, I get to meet people. It's a. It is. There is everything about, and I. T I tell, the participants, this is a positive experience today, no matter what happens. If it's not positive, it is all my fault. <laughs> and I think the passion and the enthusiasm comes to the table and if, if you get everybody excited about a process it's much easier to get to the finish line so I am passionate about it I want to 
I won't say I take it overly personally, but I feel like it is my job to help these people get together and make the right decision for the right reasons. And when they do, they all feel good about it. When you say, I do take it per. I mean, I, I think we all take it personally, but I do take it personally. I love my job. This is the, not the first time, but this is, I, I truly love my job. I come to work in a good mood every day, looking forward to the challenge, solving the puzzle. But it's funny when I leave every day, I call my husband on the phone and he knows immediately if I've settled or if I've not settled because it affects my mood. It, I take it personally if a case doesn't settle because that's my job. You know, that is my job to have the good experience, to just get cases resolved. And it's not necessarily my fault that they don't, you know, if somebody doesn't bring enough money or unrealistic expectations or whatever, but it's personal for me. I agree with everything y'all both said. You said it very succinctly too, uh, Craig, but, so or, <laughs> yes, but <laughs> one of the things that is probably the most rewarding to me is, I agree with all, all you said, but our job is also to give both sides the pieces of the puzzle they need, the educational part of mediation and giving them that information so they can analyze the risk. And I'm very passionate about making sure that they have that information. Regardless of whether the case settles or not, I know that I've done my job if I've given them that information. Sometimes it's not digested the right way, if you will, but still they're given the information. And that's where it sometimes marinates and cures, but that's my job to make sure both sides understand their risks and I I think that's the really thrilling and fun part of what we do is packaging that and giving it to both sides in a way that they can digest it and then use that information through that process of compromise and negotiation to see if we can bring closure to the case. And I'm um, very much in agreement with what y'all all said, um, but especially you, Craig. I like solving problems mm -hmm. as well and ha giving the parties closure. You know, nobody wants to be, other than maybe the lawyers, nobody wants to be involved in a lawsuit. And so to be able to solve that problem and close that down and let everybody walk away um, is really, really a wonderful feeling. Um, I usually tell the parties, you know, you might not know that this case is on your mind, but believe me, it's on your mind. And when we get it settled at the end of the day, you're going to have a great sense of relief. And my dad has a wonderful saying for that sense of relief, and that is, you don't know how bad it hurts while the horse is stepping on your foot until he gets off your foot. <laughs> oh my gosh, I didn't realize how bad that was. Mm -hmm. But now I realize because it's off and I feel so much better and I'm uplifted. Mm -hmm. Well, the more I use closure, that's where I'm at. Yeah, and as a Lawyer, I lost sight of that sometimes. I didn't realize how much misery the process was to my own clients. They said, I hate this. And I figured, I'm having a blast. <laughs> <laughs> you think a trial is fun? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> well, they don't. No, they don't. They don't. They don't. No. It, was, it surprised me because it wasn't their money or anything, but right. it was a painful experience. I, I have a catch line that I use. I call it the litigation devil that sits on the shoulder that doesn't go away until the case is resolved. I'm going to steal that. Yeah, please do. <laughs> I'm going to use it too.